Hey everybody, we are at my art desk in the living room. Actually, my art desk is that desk, right there. <laughs> but my husband's using it for plants, so we do what we can and we share whenever we can. So I am here to come back as promised and read from you, <laughs> read to you from uh, Stick Stones, Roots and Bones by Stephanie Rose Bird. Um, is one of my favorite books on hoodoo and I'm really excited to read it because a couple of you have this book now and can look forward to reading it with me. This is Stick Stones, Roots and Bones. <coughs> so, let's get to chatting about it. Uh, we are going to read from page 22 in chapter 1 and um, and the reason, or we're going to start on page 21. And this chapter is called Fixing to Work Roots, and I think that it's important that we know how to gather and dry the herbs, and there's things that I read in here that are unique to hoodoo in particular, different from from witchcraft or, or other paganism or eclectic witchcraft. There are particular ways in hoodoo to do it. So I thought it would be good to come on and tell you those differences, uh, or you can compare them kind of to what you do yourself or what you've read on your own. <clears throat> so gathering and drying herbs, I'm on page 21 toward the bottom, and it is suggestion to urban dwellers. For folk living in cities, apartments, or other tight spaces where land comes at a premium price, the primary source of gathering herbs will be specialty catalogs, health food stores, and the internet. Even within this uh, commercial arena, the way you go about gathering is critical and the relationship you develop can be meaningful, educational, and fun. Things to look for are as follows. Okay. <clears throat> are the herbs ethically harvest? harvested? Be careful about barks and roots. Some, like Little John, are over harvested and face extinction. So another one that you should also make sure to look for ethically done is Palo Santo. Um, that one is even difficult for me to find and it took me quite a long time to find someone who was finding it ethically and um, yay now I have a good supplier but it took me months and you know weeks and months and hours of research to get that person and get some good references about it. So. <clears throat> And, and why does that matter? Because the energies are still connected to it. Let's say this. Remember when we talk about eggshells and what's the difference between a brown and white eggshell in, in witchcraft? Well, generally the brown eggshells were free-range organic, etc. And if you have, hey Thomas, if you have those free-range organic eggshells next, and they're the, they're the colored ones, <clears throat> and you have it next to a white eggshell, the white eggshell that was the cheapest eggs at the grocery store those chickens were kept in cages and couldn't barely turn around and in their own feces and all that. So those negative, sad energies are still attached to it. The way they were butchered, the way the eggs were harvested, their living environment. But wouldn't you rather take it from the happy free-range chicken? Now the reason why I mm -hmm. keep both white and brown eggshells is because I use with both hands. I work with both hands. So <clears throat> you will keep the white one for baneful workings and then the organic brown shell for the, uh, you know, positive, protective, uh, beautiful workings that you'll be doing. Uh, this is my opinion, that's okay, but I just want to bring it back in and talk about how that relates to our ethically harvest herbs. Now one of the things that we probably should be using scarcely is Himalayan sea salt. It's so far away from where we are in the Americas and also, or wherever you're at, it's probably far away as well, but especially here in America, it's so far away and the emissions that it causes to get it out of the earth and get it all the way here. <clears throat> so we have to think about how ethically these things are harvested. That's all I wanted to say, but now, now back to the book, Stick Stones, Roots and Bones. Um, so. Are these herbs ethically harvested? Be careful about barks and roots. Some, like Little John, are over-harvested and face extinction. <clears throat> are the herbs organically grown? Okay, so I've talked about this quite a few times, why that's important. Um, let's say this. Say you found this beautiful bird feather and it fell off of 
you woke up and it was on the ground when you were going out to drink your morning tea. I see that as a gift, okay? A gift from Mother Earth, a gift from the spirit of the bird, who knows, okay? But I see it as a gift with energies attached to it. Now, those energies are going to be just radiating if I put that in a glass jar. If I put it in a plastic jar, we know that plastic doesn't um, help the energy radiate and it just kind of squishes energies, okay? Now follow me. Now we're going to switch it from, uh, well, so this bird feather, okay, would you feel like the energy would be tainted if you put a bunch of chemicals on it? Or would you feel like, do you see, do you feel like it would be the same exact bird feather if you dipped it in um, chemicals like Clorox or bleach or something like that or, or chlorine? <clears throat> or do you think that the energies would be much more powerful if it had never touched any of those chemicals or or whatever, right? So this is this is the mindset that I keep when I'm trying to think about like I like to go out in the middle of the woods to collect my herbs because I know nobody's been spraying them with pesticides, okay? Um, I like to go to the farms to collect my chicken's feet and my chicken eggs if I can. You know, if you're in a rural area with loads of farms, that's amazing! Make friends with a farmer, you're gonna end up with all those scraps, like the cow hooves. Um, if you do hoodoo, you're working with crushed up bones. Uh, you know, a, um, a butcher or a farm is a great place to go because what else are they doing with the bones? You can also save the bones from your big roast chicken you get at the store. Like all of these things you'll find that you need um, in hoodoo and, and it's because they were using everything that they had around them. But bringing this back to the reading in the book, um, organic is important to me because I feel like the vitality and the energies are all pure at that point and once you start putting fertilizers, pesticides, all this bug killer, the word, the, the, the name is in the word, killer, you're going to start killing off these energies, in my opinion, okay? So the book says, um, on that note about organic, are the herbs organically grown? This is the safest method for personal care products and consumables. So things that you put on your body or that you put in your body. Um, and of course we do know that. Are the herbs fresh and within their expiration date? Sh um, they should have a bright color, strong scent, and no mold or mildew. <clears throat> Are the pieces fair without excessive markups? Do some research and compare prices. Are, are the prices fair? Um, are the herbs usually in stock, uh, available without delays? Is the source convenient and practical for you? Is a knowledgeable person available to answer your questions? So when you're shopping for somebody, if you are out <coughs> um, in the city and you're shopping online, these are the things that you're going to want to have uh, on your head, these questions. Start out with a local shop if possible, then as you become comfortable with creating your own brews, you can branch out to the wholesale. Um, buying herbs in bulk saves big bucks. I attest to that all the time with you guys. Other options include visiting your local farmer's market. I highly recommend that. Uh, or driving outside the city to support roadside farm stands. Or just go to the farm. Um, if you so choose, you can also grow your favorite herbs in pots in your windowsill, terrace, or even inside using grow lights. Hello! Here's the grow lights! <laughs> All right, so these are suggestions to suburban and rural dwellers. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to have enough space to grow your own herbs, fruits, and vegetables, the following suggestions are for you. Please remember when gathering Mother Nature's gifts, approach the plants with respect. Remember when we talked about animism last night. Uh, and thank them for sharing their healing energy with you. And if the herb does more than one thing, like so many of them, but in particular mugwort or cinnamon, sit down and tell mugwort what you want it to do. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say, let's say mugwort is good for psychic awareness, astral travel, and protection. Okay? Now let's compare this to a person. And, and it would be like me. I'm good at art, I'm good at um, herbs, I'm good at doing dishes, I'm good at mowing the lawn. But if you told me Jennifer get to work 
and do work, I wouldn't know what job you wanted me to do out of all the jobs I know how to do. Mugwort does three or four things. If you just put it in a working and don't talk to Mugwort as though it has a spirit, as though it's working for you. If you don't do that, how does Mugwort know if you want help with astral travel or with psychic awareness or with protection? It doesn't. So perhaps it spreads its energy in three different directions, but you only need it for the one direction. Talk to your herbs, kiss them, tell them how much you appreciate them, and I'm not being funny. Talk to them out loud as much as you can, and they will do better workings for you, and they will know which direction to go. Because unless we say so, there's, there's three to ten directions you could go. I think cinnamon has seven or eight different things that it can do for us. But we don't know, cinnamon doesn't know until you tell it please help me with protection or anything else that might pair up with it. Okay, so I've got that thought out. Uh, now we're going to talk about... Uh, harvesting leaves. Look for leaves of a consistent green color without brown or yellow spots. Harvesting mid-morning after the dew has evaporated. Gather leaves before the plant begins to flower. For plants that have long growing sessions, such as basil or oregano, pinch back the top to prevent flowering. Flowering takes away the energy from the main body of the plant. Again, flowering takes away the energy of the main body of the plant. And flowers will come after you pinch the other ones off. It's all it wants to do is flower. It wants to self-preserve and the seeds come from the flower most of the time. So when something's gone to seed, that means it's flowered, it's done its thing, and now it's produced more seeds. So to get it to prevent it from doing that so that, because that flower, the, the thing closest toward the sun, is really going to take most of the nutrients and energy. So if you pull those flowers off, save them because they can do separate workings for you. Um, now the basil will have all the more energy and it will focus on the leaves when you're harvesting things for the leaves, like basil. We don't harvest it for the flower, we harvest it for the leaves. Um, okay, so for plants that have long growing sessions such as basil or oregano, pinch back. Flower takes um, the energy away from the main body of the plant. Keep herbs separate, separated by type and tie the stems loosely together in a bundle or else they'll mold. Um, with twine or hemp string, or raffia. Raffia is a great Hindu, uh, hoodoo ingredient, not Hindu. Um, <clears throat> until you are very familiar with all of the herbs, it is best to label the bundles and date them as well. Hang them up to dry immediately after harvesting to prevent mildew or deterioration. And if you don't know how to make a clothesline, it's pretty simple. I have a video on how I did up an indoor clothesline for my witchcraft room so I could hang a bunch of stuff that I had foraged. Um, so you can watch my indoor clothesline video. That's a good one. Oh, that's so nice, Butterfly with hot tea. I'm, I love that. You, you're just having some love at home and having some love from me here in my studio. Um, I love you guys. So hang the herb bundles stem up in the area with good circulation away from direct sunlight. <clears throat> the ideal temperature for the first 24 hours is 90 degrees. Also, if you have things at 90 degrees, like if you have a food dehydrator that uh, has a temperature gauge on it, and this is going to sound a lot like what I said with the organic stuff. Um, for those of you who know about raw foods, or a raw foods diet, um, food doesn't come above 103 mm. degrees, and it's still considered raw. And now, the temperature is debatable but everybody agrees on 103 and below is still raw. My dehydrator goes all the way down to 90. I keep it at 90. And I have two dehydrators, one that has no temperature and I know that dehydrates about 125, 130 degrees. And then the one I have a temperature, I keep at 90 degrees. Now when I put these things right next to each other, let's say I took some basil and I put it in the one that's 90 and the one that cooks at 130, because it is in fact cooking it at that point. Um, when you compare the color of the two, the 90 degree one is bright colors. Very, very rich, bright colors and still hard, crisp, dehydrated. It does take a longer time, but that's okay with me. The other dehydrator that has no gauge 
has maybe half of the amount of color and we know it's cooked because of the temperature it gets to. Now here's what I have to say about that. <clears throat> I feel like a raw carrot will do much more for me magically than a cooked carrot. And I feel like, you know how if you boil a carrot in water, uh, a lot of those nutrients go into the water? Well, I feel like when we cook something, a lot of those magical, the magical integrity of the ingredients does start to leave as well. So I like to keep my things below 103 degrees, and in here they're su suggesting 90. You're just going to have, even if it's just the color you care about, the color is going to be so much more vibrant when cooked at a lower temperature or when dehydrated at a lower temperature. Um, okay, so that being said, the ideal temperature for the first 24 hours is 90 degrees, followed by 75 to 80 degrees the rest of the time. Most herbal bundles will dry between two and three weeks. Petals and leaves should feel light, crisp, and paper-like. If there are small buds or tiny leaves that may fall off during the drying time, create a roomy muslin bag to encase flowers and leaves and tie it up loosely with twine or hemp <coughs> string at the stems. This is particularly important with seed dropping plants such as fennel or sunflowers. When herbs are completely dry, store the whole leaf and stem away from direct sunlight in a dark glass or stainless steel airtight containers. Um, another thing that I do sometimes is I take old shirts because I only have regular glass jars. I take old shirts and I cut off the sleeves and I put those as slips to keep the light out of my jars. And I, I dismembered some children's clothing and, and made it into jar covers. That's something that you guys can do. I did a video on that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, try and keep the light out. This is going to keep up the integrity of the plant as well and the integrity of the magical um, properties. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, this is particularly important for seed dropping plants such as fennel or sunflowers, some um, airtight containers. Alright, now we're going to talk about harvesting flowers in a hoodoo fashion. Flowers are extremely delicate. Select healthy flowers in the early afternoon during the dry weather conditions. Take extra care not to bruise the petals. Refrain from touching them. Cut cut from the stem and allow the flowers to drop into a basket. Dry smaller, more delicate flowers such as lavender and chamomile whole. You can hang them upside down, tied with twine over a muslin cloth or a large bowl or wrapped loosely in a muslin to retain the dried buds. Use fresh flower in the home whenever possible. Use fresh flowers in the home whenever possible. You may also freeze them in an ice cube tray filled with spring water. Now we're going to talk about harvesting seeds. Hi, love, light, and peace forever. How are you? Welcome to the chat. And Sue, how are you? So good to see you guys. And Jojo. Is Jojo here? Hey, Jojo Morris. Everybody thanks Jojo Morris. She just um, bought me a birthday gift, and it is going to be coming and here for me to open on my birthday party on June 6th. And I hope that all of you guys get a chance to attend my birthday party. And I did leave my P.O. box at the end of the last video. I'll leave it again at the end of this video if you guys want to send something our way and donate to the channel. Uh, all right. So thanks again, Jojo Morris. She sent um, Scott Cunningham's biography, and I'm so freaking excited to read it. I can't even tell you. All right. So harvesting flowers, harvesting seeds. Collect the seeds on a warm, dry day. Seeds need to dry in a warm, airy environment. <clears throat> Make provisions to catch the quickly drying seeds by placing a bowl or lunch or box underneath the hanging plants. Harvesting bark. Bark peels easiest on damp days. Choose a young tree or bush, and if possible, one that has already been pruned, cut, or taken down naturally by wind or stormy conditions to prevent damage or even death to the plant. Stripping too much bark from a tree will kill it. A thoughtful approach to Mother Nature's gift is essential. Bark may harbor insects or moss, so wash it first and allow it to dry flat on wax paper in a location that is well ventilated and away from direct sunlight. Harvesting Roots Roots are ready for collecting after the autumn harvest. Dig up roots after their plant has begun to wither and die. Extract the whole root while, drying, uh, while trying not to bruise it. Like bark, roots need to be cleaned before they are dried, and they also require ethical harvesting. Cutting roots into small sections and, and dry in an, even, in an oven set between 120 and 140 degrees. 
Uh, I put mine in my dehydrator. <clears throat> Turn and check them regularly. Roots should feel light and airy like sawdust when fully dried. For marshmallow root, peel away the top layer of skin before drying in this manner. Now we're going to talk about harvesting berries. To mm. harvest berries, use the same procedure as for bark. But remember, berries are fruits and take a long time to dry. Berries take a long time. Okay. So yeah, berries take a really long time to dry. About tw it says here about twice as long as leaves. Not for me. It takes much, much longer than leaves. You will know when they are fully dry, but here we're talking about just in the air, I think. Um, you know when the berries are fully dry because they will become very light, wrinkled, and reduced in size by nearly half. Turn them frequently to check for leaking juices. Replace the paper you're drying on often to prevent the growth of bacteria or mold. Um, I don't think that berries would get dry enough to not mold. That's why I would put them in the dehydrator. When I've tried to do air drying or even sun drying of berries, it's just it's just ended up in mold, and so I kind of wasted the berries. But I, I dehydrate them now in the 90 degree dehydrator. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about storage. Since the flavors and volatile oils of herbs mix readily, um, store herbs separately. Label and date sterile tinted glass or stainless steel containers. Keep in a cool, dark place. And finally, and final quality of your herbs depends on how well they are stored and prepared. Uh, and then we go into extraction techniques. And uh, let's just do extracting techniques and then we're done with the chapter and we'll come back a different time and talk about something else. So we'll talk about the extraction techniques here really quick. Do any of you guys know a, um, at least one extraction technique for herbs? Um, I want to know if, hey, Ash is here, how are you? Hey, Ash, did you see that you got a card in my tarot deck? And were you happy with your card? Ash Storm Heathen, what card did you get? You got the Five of Swords, girl. Are you okay with that card? I put you in my tarot deck. Do you guys know any herb extractions? How do you, how do you guys, there's three extraction techniques here for, for, like basically herbal extractions. Do you guys know any herbal extractions before I name three of them? How do we get the qualities out of the herbs? What is one of the extraction methods? I'm patiently waiting, I know somebody will guess. One starts with a D, one starts with an I, and one starts with a T. These extraction methods. Nobody? Anybody? Bueller? Tincture, there we go. Thank you, Iridescent C. Yes, a tincture. And that's probably one of the most common ways that people think of this. Iridescent C says distill. Excellent. That's what I've asked for for my birthday, is a distill, um, a steam distiller that you can put right over a flame and I'm going to be making my own aromatherapy oils. I am so freaking excited that uh, my husband got me a steam distiller for my birthday, I think. I only asked him for one thing and I showed him two models and it looked like he got it. So hopefully I get one of those that will be here for my birthday party and we can do some um, herbal extractions together. Now the other two forms in this book are infusions and decoctions, okay? And I don't think, I think we talk about tinctures a ton, but I don't feel like we talk about um, decoctions enough. And infusions here and there, but decoctions are cool. Um, so let's, uh, uh, decoctions is the first one that we'll talk about again. We're reading from Stick Stones, Roots and Bones by Stephanie Rose Burke. <sighs> All right. A decoction is the extraction of medicines from roots bark or berries. Roots, bark, or berries. This is done by simmering the items in a covered pan of water over medium-low heat for 30 minutes to 5 hours depending on the toughness of the herb. 
So if it was like a big thick puff root like mandrake, you would probably want to go the full five hours, if not maybe even longer, I'm not sure. I would refer to what Scotty says about his decoctions as well as Stephanie Rosebird. But Stephanie Rosebird is just talking about Hindu workings, okay? Or excuse me, hoodoo workings. Um, so that is her method for decoction. But if you were doing a berry, it may take as little as 30 minutes. <clears throat> now the infusions. Infusions are either water or oil based. Both are designed to extract the volatile oils from the tender parts of herbs. Water-based infusions are teas, also tisanes or brews. They are made from pouring boiling distilled water over the herb and keeping it covered for 30 minutes to one hour. Okay, so an infusion is like a tea or our herbal baths that we soak in. Um, what else could we think of as an infusion? I mean, if you do a working in water so, and have herbs in there, some sort of infusion is going to happen, even if it's not a hot boiling water. Um, Oil-based infusions are created by loosely packing herbal materials into a sterilized container and then pouring oil over the plants. Types of oils commonly preferred include olive oil, sunflower oil, almond oil, and safflower oil. Cover the container tightly, keep it away from direct sunlight, and give the jar a whirl every day for four to six weeks, depending on the desired strength. I say you might as well go the full amount of time, because you, you may as well get what you need from the herb. However, if you're sick and you're trying to make a tincture to get better, um, well, you should have made it before the sixth season came, but you, you could probably pull it out as quick as you want. Um, and now we have tinctures. I don't know if they're going to talk about using apple cider vinegar as a tincture puller, but I will tell you that Lady Grave Dancer suggested it in one of her videos on making a, like a get better tincture that you could like never get a cold during the winter if you just took a tablespoon of this every day. I use it as elderberry, echinacea, and Bragg's raw unfiltered apple cider vinegar with the probiotic, the mother in it, um, and you know this extraction this will work as an extraction if you want to do one that's alcohol free hey beautiful wife good to see you i just love your red hair all right so tinctures tincture is extraction of medicinal qualities from the herb using alcohol such as vodka grain alcohol rum or ethanol if you are gluten free you need to make sure if you buy a tincture it says gluten free because otherwise the grain alcohol is not going to be good for you so you can make tinctures if you can't find them, and you can make them with a vodka base. Now just remember that vodka can't go up as high in percentage as a grain alcohol. The grain alcohol that I use is 98 or 99 proof, and it, no, it's 198, 196 proof, which makes it 98% or something alcohol. I've tasted it before, it's absolutely repulsive. Um, but when you put it in a tincture, all you taste, you only take a few drops anyway, and all you taste is the uh, herb, really. Um, okay, so vodka, grain alcohol, rum, or ethanol, and that's what you soak your herb in. Uh, the concentrations of volatile oils are greater in tinctures than in infusions or decoctions. A sterilized container with a cork or other tight-fitting top is filled to the top with loosely packed herbal material. And then, so you, you pack your thing completely with herbs, pack it, and then pour the alcohol over because it's going to, it's going to go down and you'll have room to shake. Um, so do not use rubbing alcohol, it is too harsh for drying, well yeah, don't use rubbing alcohol because you're going to ingest this. Don't use an alcohol you wouldn't swallow, okay? Place on a sunny window seal or, and swirl gently every day for four to six weeks. Strain off the herbs, and so this is where it's different. The tinctures we're not storing in the dark. The tinctures we're storing in a sunny windowsill. There's two things I like about this. The sun or Ra or our Egyptian deities can bless it during the day, and then the moonlight can bless it during the evening, uh, which I really love. Um, so place on a sunny windowsill and swirl gently every day for four to six weeks. Strain off the herbs or flowers and decant into a sterilized tinted bottle. Uh, lastly, we're going to talk about something called specialties. Variations can be treated by following 
following the tincture procedure, but replacing the alcohol with different liquids. There we go! The thing I was talking about with the Bragg's apple cider vinegar would be called a specialty tincture. Um, vinegar makes an acidic extract. Four Thieves Vinegar, a popular hoodoo formula, uses garlic vinegar. Um, and we have a recipe in this book for Four Thieves Vinegar. Uh, macerated buds of flower petals added to vegetable glycerin makes an emollient. Scented extract and honey poured over macerated buds or petals produces a delicately scented edible emollient tincture that is terrific in love potions and edible body rubs. Woo! Edible body rubs! Jeez Louise! <laughs> Um, Ash Storm Heathen says, Okay, babe, I just bought the Skullcap Tincture as per your and Alex's recommendation. Yay! I'm going to be making Skullcap Tincture, too. I don't know what I have to do in order to actually sell it. Like, I have to get some sort of commercial kitchen or something. But, hey, Madam Butterfly, I'm working on your card today. I wish I could show it to you, but I can't. But I'm looking at it right now. She got the desk card, and it's a good one. Hi, Erica. Hi, everybody. So we just got done reading from Stick Stones, Roots and Bones. Um, we've been reading for half an hour. I have to get back to my tarot cards, but I do promise you guys that I will come back on today and find a brilliant topic, topic to talk about. Before this video, if you like the show Friends, make sure to watch my Friends videos because we are talking about Friends and Witchcraft. Lastly, and how Phoebe is a witch and I've got a conspiracy for it. Lastly, I'm going to give my P.O. box out because my birthday party is going to be on June 6th on YouTube. We're throwing a party Thursday, June 6th on YouTube. Um, so if you guys want to give me a birthday gift, uh, and, and you can just send it my way, and I will open all my gifts on my birthday on the channel. It'll be loads of fun, just like we did for Yule. Um, so P.O. box 383 Seabeck, S-E-A-B-E-C-K, Washington, W-A-S-H-I-N-G-T-O-N, 98383. And then you can just address it to either the Taxidermy Witch or Gen Z, like Zebra. Alright guys, make sure to check out my Patreon, and I will talk to you